<laughs> All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Capitalism Workshop, Digital Games, a canary in the coal mine of capital, featuring our guest presenter, Daniel Josephs. Um, my name is Tanner Merlis, and I'm one of the co-organizers of tonight's session, and it's really great to see such a large turnout on a cold night, and especially for a topic that I'd argue only 20, 30 years ago was not taken seriously as a site of critical political economy analysis or union mobilization and struggle. So it's great to see a turnout like this for tonight's event. Um, I'll tell you a bit about the Capitalism Workshop, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Daniel, and then we'll proceed with tonight's session. So the Capitalism Workshop is supported by the Center for Social Justice and the Socialist Project, and it's a series of workshops, monthly or bi-monthly, that brings together professors, students, activists, community members, and workers with the goal of refining our understanding of capitalism so we can think through how to build paths for going beyond it. This is a public and pluralistic educational forum for people to share and dissect ideas about the conditions and problems of capitalism and debate left and socialist strategies, Marxist theoretical tactics and strategies as well for confronting them. We envisage this to be a space between academia and activism where we can present work in prog progress, finished work, and self-reflexively create and assess a variety of concepts for understanding and changing the world. I think that the first time I played a video game was, was in 1984. I think I was about six and a half years old at the time, and I recall playing the ColecoVision version of Donkey Kong. And at the time, ColecoVision, I think, was a rival home console to Atari. For those of you that are better game historians, is that correct? So in academia, um, the digital games industry has become a significant site for research on capitalism and class as well. Uh, thanks in part to Nick Dyer Witherford and Greg DePuter's path-breaking book, Games of Empire, which in 2009 offered the premier critical political economy of communication analysis of, quote, virtual games within a system of global ownership, private property, coercive class relations, military operations, and radical struggle. So end quote. I mean, that's a quote from um, the, the preface to their book. Subsequent critical research has examined the game industry's accumulation strategies, the ways nation states are facilitating and legitimizing this accumulation, the class relations between video game owners, managers, workers, and players, the play labor process, and class inequality, conflict, and union organizing in the sector. Happily, tonight's featured presenter is one such critical political economist who has already made timely and novel contributions to this emerging and important field. Daniel Joseph is a postdoctoral fellow and lecturer in the Department of Arts, Culture, and Media at the University of Toronto, a stellar political economist of the digital games industry, and his research has already appeared in leading journals such as Games and Culture, Triple C, and Loading. Also, Daniel is a freelance journalist whose work in writings on platform capitalism in the games industry has been published by The Jacobin, Real Life Magazine, and also Vice. Significantly, Daniel is a member of the recently formed Toronto chapter of Game Workers Unite, an international grassroots democratic organization advocating for the unionization and collective action of game workers that seeks to empower those suffering this industry's often precarious and exploitative labor regime. So I hope actually there are some other members of Game Workers Unite here tonight as well, because their contributions will be certainly valued in the question and answer period. So in tonight's session of the Capitalism Workshop, Daniel will help us understand how the digital games industry is a canary in the coal mine of capitalism, something that tells us about the dangers coming our way, as well as the new forms of class struggle emerging in response. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Daniel. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, Super thanks to the organizers um, for having me here. I really, really appreciate that. The opportunity to do this, this is really cool. And um, <clears throat> yeah, without further ado, I'll just jump right into what I've got here. So, uh, digital games, a canary in the coal mine of capital. So, it's a kind of, it's a normal thing in my field. Well, not so much anymore, but it used to be that we'd always have to argue why I care about digital games. And the current thing I'm always saying to people is this, canaries help workers from dying from gas asphyxiation, but also I think I would hope that tell us about what's happening in the future of capitalism, and, and again, like kind of as Tanner just said, like future forms of struggle, future forms of um, resistance. So that's kind of the metaphor I'm working with here. We'll see if it works, but basically the games industry has given us advance warning about a number of different things. So 
If you're interested in the distribution and consumption of cultural commodities, uh, games have been on the internet for a very long time, shareware, digital distribution services, things like that. We have kind of like we're pioneered with games, um, virtual and digital mass consumer marketplaces. So people were buying and selling digital commodities in virtual worlds for a long time now. Uh, we can also look at the capture of unwaged labor, digital labor, labor, other kinds of concepts that have been developed in and around game studies. It's kind of like a formative space for that kind of work. Um, we also can look to games for augmented and alternate reality, which right now are still not super huge industries, but are growing and they're becoming more and more important. Uh, mass data collection and contingent commodities, more on those later, but a lot of games have been reliant and be, um, been particularly enmeshed with data collection, surveillance, capitalism, things like that. We can also look at them as pioneers of top-to-bottom platform integration. If you, you know, a ColecoVision or an Odyssey, a Magnavox Odyssey, Nintendo, a PlayStation, things like that, we can look uh, to, you know, like those dynamics as like things that presaged what came and what we're dealing with now with platforms. Um, and then kind of a big key thing that I'm really intrigued by is just the ongoing dynamics of digital centralization, monopolization in the industry and kind of how that's playing out um, in other tech industries and games have been kind of at the forefront of that. So we can also say that we should care about games uh, as just like a important part of contemporary culture. So uh, they make lots of money, they compete with Hollywood cinema. They don't make more money than cinema like as like a whole industry, instead they make more money than Hollywood box office receipts. Okay, so that's a key thing to know. Uh, more people than ever before now make games. If you don't make games, I uh, probably know someone who does. Maybe it's just as a hobbyist. Uh, it might be as someone who works at a major studio. Um, games have been at the center of culture wars, so if you're familiar with Gamergate and other harassment campaigns against women and feminists, you can look for games culture as kind of like a breeding ground for that. I mean, like the alt-right and the, the, a lot of people say Gamergate was kind of like a a trial balloon for their, like harassment techniques that were used during um, the 2016 election in the United States. Uh, we know that games inform how we think about violence and war, obviously, and games come from the military industrial complex, right? And they've been heavily enmeshed with that uh, since their origins, they continue to be. Um, and yeah, they came out of like military computing on uh, the computers that were used to uh, calculate death tolls for nuclear war. So what am I gonna talk about I'm going to talk about uh, kind of like three things. So the, commodif the commodification of play, so how the games industry is at the frontiers of commodification. And then I'm going to talk about working conditions in the game industry. So I'll talk a little bit about crunch, right? This is the thing that we all want to like that. If you're going to get your intro to what games work is like, crunch is really the way to understand it. Um, and then third, I'll kind of give you a little bit of a description of what Game Workers Unite is, how it came to be, and kind of what's happening now with that. I will not talk about media effects research. <laughs> um, if you're intrigued or want to know if games make you violent or mean or uh, more aggressive, that is not my field of research. There are people that do that, and so far most of the research says very slightly, but not much. So I want to talk about that some other time maybe. So digital gaming by the numbers. Uh, it makes lots of money. That's the interactive media market. Okay, so that's revenues. One, uh, 105 billion. Market growth continues to be extremely strong for an industry, 12% in 2016, 2017. I'm pretty sure it continued to skyrocket in 2018 as well. So that's very high. And you'd be completely unsurprised to know that that high growth is almost entirely due to mobile. Okay? So it's the biggest platform in the world. It dwarfs every other single platform that you would ever be familiar with associated with the AAA games industry. And that's because 2.9 billion people have phones, and more and more people will have phones soon. So that is the audience of people. Now, not all of those necessarily are smartphones, that a lot of them might be feature phones, but that increasingly is changing, right? So 46% of all people who play games are women. This doesn't mean that 46% of women identify as gamers in the kind of sense of like of, a, of the culture associated with hardcore gaming, but in the sense that people who play games, 46% of them are women. So it's like increasingly less and less um, like divided by gender in, as far as consumption is concerned. And I wouldn't be a good media studies scholar if I wasn't talking about uh, convergence culture. So games aren't just about playing games anymore. They're also about the media empires and the media, tra like transmedia franchises and all this other stuff that arises around it. 
So who here knows what a Let's Play is? Sort of, some people, yeah, yeah. So a Let's Play is like where you basically upload a video um, of you playing the game and then other people can watch it, okay? So streaming is also a huge thing, live, watching someone watch, play a game live, whether that is like an eSport, a competitive game, or just a game with a story, doing any kinds of stuff. That is huge. Amazon owns Twitch.tv, which is uh, one of the world's largest streaming sites. And so this is all contributing to the fact that 665 million people engage with game-related content without actually playing games. So the old paradigm of producing and manufacturing games is defined like this. Uh, you would put a box together made out of plastic, you'd put some hardware in it, you'd put some software on it, you'd put some DRM, some digital rights management tools on it, and you would then sell it at a loss to consumers. Those consumers would then buy games for them, and you as the manufacturer of the console would recoup those losses in manufacturing a piece of hardware through uh, licensing agreements with the uh, developers of games, right? So third-party games developed outside of, say, Sony for a PlayStation would make money for Sony through licensing, all right? This is what we still have today to a certain extent. We've got Nintendo with the Switch there in the middle, uh, and we have the Xbox One, all right? So this is the AAA model of making a game. You sell a game for about these days, like $80, all right? But this is the new paradigm and the one that's actually shaping what's happening in games development right now. So the majority of mobile games played now are played on app stores, and those app stores are run by Apple and Google, meaning that the biggest people to profit off of games in the entire world right now are Apple and Google, okay? So, and this also means that the one thing about these stores is that Theoretically, anyone can upload to them, right? So they're not locked and gated like consoles were. You'd have to actually make a relationship with Sony or Microsoft or Nintendo to actually get your games published on those consoles, all right? So mobile has really changed that. And what are the games on mobile? Well, they're ones that came out of social media platforms like Candy Crush, right? Who here has played a Candy Crush game? A few? All right, so you know how it works. You play for a couple hours or a couple minutes and then it says you run out of energy. Would you like to keep playing? Give us five bucks, right? The whole idea is that like it's free, but there's other incentives to keep you playing. It's also ad supported. Um, games like Clash of Clans are also huge. Uh, it's not even called Clash of Clans anymore. Um, well, some of them are. So the, the top selling game by revenue in uh, app stores in 2017 was Clash Royale, company uh, made by the company Supercell. So if you look here, here are the top games that made money in app stores, and this is from a current research project I have going on right now on the economics of app stores. So that's with my uh, research group, um, the App Studies Initiative at the University of Toronto, and I'm doing that with uh, David Nieborg and Christopher Young. Really cool. I'm not going to be talking too much about that today, but just to get a sense, you'll see a lot of the same names over and over again. That means there's incumbency in this market, all right? So let's talk about the commodification of play. That's something I think is really key to understand, to understand the class struggles that come in the games industry. So games are once discrete cultural commodities. You'd have to buy them, all right? Either on a disc or a floppy disk or a cartridge for your Nintendo or your Game Boy or DVDs for your consoles. You can still buy them, right? So games are still sold this way. They're sold as distinct commodities, right? So the normal accumulation process you'd associate with production, it, it exists here. And the way they enforce scarcity is through you know, like through technological fixes on consoles or, um, you know, intellectual property rights, things like that, right? But now, that kind of old model of selling things basically at a, uh, for a premium price and then realizing value has changed to a kind of more nebulous and strange uh, way of consuming and commodifying play. So, we have here is a loot box. Has anyone ever bought a loot box in your life? One person. Only, that's it? Okay, so no one else, so maybe a loot box you bought? All right, well, the, if you're wondering what a loot box is, it's basically a box that you'd spend anywhere between like three to five bucks on, um, and it will spit out items for you in the game that you're playing, all right? And it'll be cosmetic items. It'll make your character look different. It might be a, here's like a thing that makes your character say different things. Here's an outfit for your character. Here's a little spray paint can that you can spray things on the wall. Um, the point is, is that, but it's randomized, so it's like a slot machine. All right, so you're buying the chance to win some items that you might or might not want. All right, and this is one of the prime ways of making money in digital games these days. All right, this game Overwatch is sold for a premium price right now. I think you could probably buy it for 40 bucks. 
But if you want to get all of these extra items inside of it, well, it just so happens that there's a marketplace there for you to buy things, okay? Um, there's also new models based on freemium, all right? And this, you'll see this reflected in the mobile game space, but you can also see it with games like Fortnite, which if you have children of a certain age, or if you yourself play Fortnite because you like battle royale games, I don't know. Um, this is a game that you can get for free, but if you want, you can spend money on cosmetic items and that. So it's not randomized like a loot box. You can instead buy a fancy outfit for your character or whatever. And again, like it's all controlled within the game. So you know, it's not like you could cheat it and get things you want or whatever. You have to pay money to get these certain items. So we're talking about virtual commodities, uh, enforced scarcity through code and other kinds of things like that. Um, there's also been a switch in the games industry towards subscription models, all right? Uh, if you're familiar with any of the research done by Dwayne Winsack at the University of, uh, is it Carleton or Ottawa? I forget. Is it Carleton? Yeah, yeah. So he does research on the Canadian media industry, and one thing he's always hammering on about is that most of the money made in the media industries right now in Canada is made through subscription services, and there's been a big shift in the games industry towards subscription services as a result of not of Canadian policy or whatever, but just as because it's one way of consistently generating revenue. Um, Fortnite is free, but you can buy these subscription passes that get unlock the ability to then play a game and get more items from it. I'm not going to go into specifics here, but basically these commodities are no longer just about buying a thing and realizing value. Instead, you kind of engage into a relationship uh, with these games. Um, there's also gamification, again, kind of like a, a spin on freemium. You can now just play fake slot machines and card games and poker and all this kind of stuff all day. And as long as you don't make real money from it, it's not considered gambling legally. A few countries have rules about this. Uh, China obviously has instituted some rules um, on what gamification can look like, whether or not you can buy loot boxes, things like that. Belgium has outlawed certain forms of loot boxes. And there's things like modifications, which goes back to consumer um, consumers basically creating value for companies not getting paid to do it. So this is like fandom, right? Like, or you make new content for a game and then they incorporate that into the game themselves or whatever. Um, I've written a lot about this. I have a paper on the website called The Discourse of Digital Dispossession. If you're intrigued by modifications and hobbies and how it's commodified and stuff like that, I've written about that. Um, so all this is to kind of get to the point of just this idea that's happening right now is, is of the contingent commodity. Okay, so there's this great paper by uh, David Nieborg and Thomas Poole, and they talk about how products and services offered and circulated by digital platforms and informed by datafied user feedback open to constant revision and recirculation. So we're seeing commodities that are always contingent. They're, they're basically never, they never end. They're always are waiting for you to give feedback to them so they might change, right? And this might be through subscription. This might be through, um, just you bought it and it's yours, but it changes. Like if you buy a video game, the chances are it will change within a few weeks. Okay, like these commodities are no longer static as they come to you. So this is a really important thing for me, and this is really at the cutting edge of like platforms, capitalism, and games. And so I kind of you know like to wrap this section up, we can kind of talk about how ad-supported and freemium business models don't really work in small scales. They work at scale. Okay, at the largest possible scale, which means there's a very strong incentive to horizontally and vertically integrate in this industry, right? And one thing about mobile gaming success of that specific way of extracting value from consumers and exploiting uh, value is that it is kind of reshaping the AAA space. So all of those console companies now are making games that have commodities in them that are very much, very similar to what you see in Candy Crush or Overwatch or other kinds of things. Like there's been a shift in how that industry makes money for itself. Um, so to kind of get more to the nuts and bolts of labor in this industry, we can talk about like the labor of game work. All right. So a lot of people might think that being a game developer is really cool because you get to work on something that you love. Most people that make games make them because they love them, right? That's why people want to work in any industry where you get to be creative. Um, but it's not really quite as awesome as it might seem. For instance, if you want to get into game work, one of the few paths is either you know, getting lucky and getting a pretty good position, or you work through quality assurance work, which is basically the bottom of the scale, and you just sit there trying to break a game all day. That work is, tends to be based on contract. Um, you normally get fired after the project ends, things like that. 
passion and dreams is used a lot as kind of a rhetoric to justify uh, poor working conditions. And most importantly, crunch happens, which is anywhere beyond 50 hours of work, that's my definition, I guess, of, uh, yeah, like if you work more than 50 hours a week, four months, right? And so, oh, and the key part of crunch is also you don't get paid overtime, right? You're not getting paid overtime in these industries because you're on salary and it's assumed that you don't actually put in for it. So what is crunch? Well, it's a product of a highly financialized industry. Uh, the biggest game studios really institutionalized this as a practice for everyone. And um, it really is a big part of how most large video game studios are publicly traded corporations, right? So they work on a quarterly schedule. They need to make certain kinds of release dates. And that means there's a huge incentive for their teams to try and ram out content on schedule, all right? And it's like basically what you're talking about here is that these massive deadlines shape the entire structure of the, of the work site. So there's this huge pressure to finish. Recently, uh, anyone here play Red Dead Redemption 2? Yeah, all right, so Red Dead Redemption 2, huge game, ridiculously complex, full of animals, like it's kind of, like, it's so big, it's, it's massive. But to make that massive space requires a massive amount of labor, right? Like everything has to be handmade basically with digital tools. So the two leads on this project literally say we were working 100 hour weeks, all right? They said this to the journal, to a journalist who was like, okay. And then they wrote this in an article and there was a huge push blowback about this, right? Um, but the important thing is, is that like, this was normal to them. They said, well, of course we were working 100 hours a week. This is how the video game industry works, okay? No one likes it. Maybe the corporates, uh, I'm sure the, sh the suits like it. Um, the workers don't, so it's, you know, it's justified as being a part of the culture. If our studio doesn't do it, other people will. It's normally an argument for it. Um, there's massive burnout in this industry, okay? And there are very few veterans. People normally don't stay in this industry beyond 35 or 40. So if you go to a game studio, everyone who has like fancy titles, like lead this, lead that, whatever, management is often young. And that's because they, those people get to a certain age and they have certain responsibilities, like a family, children, and they normally will leave for some kind of other tech industry. And this leads to how the industry unfairly impacts um, lots of different issues in, in the social world of workers, I and mean, one of them is reproductive labor. So there was a big uh, moment in 2004 where Aaron Hoffman, who under the pseudonym of EA Spouse, created a blog, and then basically when he talked about how she was just like, her life was being ruined because her husband was never home. And this was, this was happening in Vancouver at the time. You know, she says, if I could get EA CEO Larry Probst on the phone, there are a few things I would ask him. That when you keep our husbands and wives and children in the office for 90 hours a week, sending them home exhausted and numb and frustrated with their lives, it's not just them you're hurting, but everyone around them, everyone who loves them. When you make your profit calculations and your cost analyses, you know that a great measure of that cost is being paid in raw human dignity, right? So here we just see, you know, this one, you know, we would call, ab, you know, uh, uh, absolute uh, exploitation, right? And so beyond crunch, some game workers still get paid okay. Some works, some companies are better than others. Some companies have very bad cultures. Some are have really, you know, better cultures. But generally speaking, um, it's, you know, there's a lot of bad things about it uh, broadly. One of them is gender, one of them is race. Um, both are highly, like, unequally uh, distributed through the companies themselves. Um, closing a studio is really easy. Like, I mean, if you just think about, like, labor arbitrage or, like, if you want to just shut down something, like, you're basically just closing a place that you rented the floor space and a bunch of computers, okay? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of fixed capital involved in the, cre the uh, creation of video games. Um, very recently, Activision Blizzard fired 775 workers. Just because. Um, there was their most profitable year on record, and uh, their, uh, the CEO, the president and CEO, um, basically said, like, hey, we just didn't meet our, we didn't do our best. Like, we thought this was our best year, but we didn't meet our own internal expectations for what was best. So let's just fire off 775 people. All right, um, and just broadly speaking, as you probably already know, there is really no historic involvement with the labor movement, which has always been an issue. 
So to kind of talk about how that's changing, let's talk about a grassroots response to that. Uh, anyway, so in 2018, about this time last year, probably a little bit earlier, uh, me and some friends are hanging out in the only Facebook group I like, uh, which is basically a secret Marxism Facebook group for video games. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're hanging out, sharing memes, talking about stuff, uh, complaining about the state of the industry, things like that. And then we notice that there is a, uh, a, a proposed panel at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. All right, and it is titled, Union Now, Pros, Cons, and Consequences of Unionization for Game Devs. And it was being organized in part by the International Game Developers Association, which is kind of, uh, you know, in what we would call a company uh, association for um, the games industry. Workers are a part of it, but so is management, right? And it's supposed to represent the needs of everyone in the video game industry, but you know, because of fiduciary responsibility, they can't advocate for unionization or workers' rights. So it's really just there to talk about, you know, like maybe we should get some more tax breaks for video game companies. Anyway, so it seems like pretty clearly this is being set up to be kind of like a rhetorical device to say unionization is not appropriate for the video games industry. So people in this group, and soon more from outside of it, all start trying to find a way to organize, and they create some of the propaganda you are now you probably have picked up already. Um, and you know, writing pamphlets, talking, making arguments about like why exactly is this long overdue? And the and the spark of intensity and the interest in this was absolutely shocking to see. Like I, I mean, we've there's a bunch of us in and around this industry, academics, workers. Um, artists, all kinds of people who talk about this stuff, but you, you do feel like sometimes you're in the social bubble, right? That's what Facebook is really good at creating. Twitter's good at that as well. Um, but it, a lot of people, you know, really wanted to get involved. And so the Discord server gets created, and if you're not familiar with Discord, it's kind of like Slack. It's really just a chat room that you can uh, use to organize and stuff like that. Um, there's documents are made, and this round table happens. And people are there, right? They actually speak up, you know? And um, someone I know, Squinky, they are there and they say, you know, like women, people of color, trans people, queer people, disabled people, non-binary people, unions can help fight for equal pay regardless of your ability to participate in the process, right? They start making cases that like, oppression can be fought with unions, not just saying like, it's just there to protect you as a worker, but like kind of really making a case that it's like, it's a broader social mission. Okay, and these people cause a little bit of a ruckus at GDC, which is good. Um, and this, out of this kind of, you know, people say we should keep this going. So this organization, Game Workers Unite, has a website. It looks real, and uh, it keeps going, right? Like people keep organizing. People start setting up local chapters. Okay, and so there's I could I'm actually not sure how many chapters there are, there are because it has escaped beyond my like I'm focused on the one here. But I don't know, like it's so big now and it's so international that I, I hardly can keep track of what's happening, right? Um, it's across the world, it's international. Uh, people from uh, France who actually have a video game union, because of course they have video game unions in France, um, you know, came to San Francisco and like helped out. And, you know, so it's in Europe. I know there's organizing right now happening in Scandinavia and there's, you know, organizing happening in Montreal right now. There's mm -hmm. more stuff is planned for GDC this year, which is about to come up in March, right? Um, very, uh, not too long ago, in December, Game Workers Unite UK in conjunction with the IWGB, which is kind of like a small trade union really focused on uh, organizing unorganized workers and like uh, gig economy stuff in the UK. They, through connections that um, they already had with game workers, like actually were able to get a trade union legally certified in the UK, which like is something I'm so jealous of because we cannot just do this. Like you can't just make a trade union in, in Canada for many reasons, um, which is awesome. So now they're actually, they have legal status. They can start doing, organizing a much broader base, right? Um, which is really cool. So that's already happened. Um, all this to say is that nearly one year out, there's a lot of stuff going on, right? And it's, you know, being organized by real class struggle oriented people. You know, I don't know anyone who's like, I'm really excited to get my company union going or just like, just protect me and mine, right? Like there's a strong sense of international solidarity here, which is really cool. And it's been, you know, like there's been interactions with lots of different political organizations, but also 
with uh, local unions, local activists, local social movements, mass organizations, things like that, which has been pretty cool. Um, it's still run almost entirely on donations. There was some looking into uh, creating an NPO in the US and that just, it didn't work organizationally, which is totally great and uh, I don't mind that at all because um, NPOs can really uh, mess things up sometimes. But it's it's been interesting to see how it's still really driving on its own force, right? Like, um, it's spatialized mostly in urban centers, but of course there's still lots of work to be done. There still hasn't, we're waiting for that test case of the first shop in North America to get organized. Like, we don't know what that's gonna look like yet. Will it be a small company that's like six people and they all are like, our boss is pretty nice, they don't care, it's all good. Maybe that'll happen, or maybe it'll happen at a big studio, I don't know, we still don't know. Um, all this to say, like, I, you know, I didn't go too deep into theory here, but uh, this really kind of, for me, comes back to something I've been writing about for a long time, back in uh, 2014, I guess 2015 it says that, what it says here, I've been really thinking about this concept of the digital spatial fix, about how when capital find, like hits a crisis, it hits a barrier, and this is like kind of derived from David Harvey's work, but you, you see Capital can't abide by that, so it tries to find new spaces to move into. Video games and digital, the digital world, virtual commodities and all this kind of stuff, the internet has been a place for capital to kind of retreat into, or not even so much retreat as like charge desperately and bloodily into, okay? Um, I think digital games, especially mobile connected ones, network technologies, new kinds of commodities, contingent commodities and things like that, that's where a lot of money's been dumped, and that's why there's so much growth. Um, we still haven't hit a new, another crisis yet. There was a crisis of the video game industry in 1983, which is definitely a product of financialization um, when Atari got bought by a Warner. Um, and it led to a crash. That hasn't happened yet, but it very likely will. And the only thing that's going to protect workers, I think, if that happens, is unions, um, and specifically class struggle more broadly. So I would say, you know, to come back to my metaphor, like games are telling us a lot about what's happening in capital across the board, but especially what's happening in digital, uh, in, in the digital spaces, on the internet, um, and in cultural production. And uh, the cool, like the slow building of class consciousness in industry, you know, shows that even though this industry was born in the middle of neoliberalism, really at its, at its, like, you know, if you think the late 70s is like when the neoliberal project finally gets to get accepted by states, Right? Um, games are basically born then, right? Like the games industry comes out of that specific moment. And so for me, that has always explained why unionization has been so slow. The labor movement has been so slow to get into that space because it happened at a very bad time. But it's changing. And so that means that conditions have changed. Struggle continues. Um, yeah. And so anyway, we should keep paying attention to games because they'll tell us about what's coming in the future. So that's me. Thank you.